Well, we have uh, a, sort of an arts conversation for you now. Uh, we've done a lot of classical conversations with uh, musicians and composers and what have you, but now we have a different kind of artist, and that is Matt Wadel. Matt has a brand new exhibit that's opening at the Toledo Museum of Art in November, and uh, Matt has joined us to talk about that. I'm Brad Cresso. Mary Claire Murphy is here, and, and Matt Wadel is also here. Welcome, Matt. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is called Phenomenal Debris, right? The uh, exhibit is called that. And you work with clay and other ceramics and glass and lots of different materials to create these uh, wonderfully colorful pieces of, of art. I wonder if we can start maybe with uh, a little background on you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I my dad's a potter, and so I grew up within the kind of uh, field of ceramics. You know, maybe I don't really work with glaze, but I work with, I mean, I don't work with glass, but I work with glaze, which is similar, yeah. but so as like a glass painting medium on clay. Um, so I grew up with that as a foundation for self, for identity in many ways of, of clay being just a, a material of curiosity. Um, and as I grew up, that kind of became the medium of my practice as a sculptor. Yeah. Now you're based right now in Ohio, right? You're from Ohio. I'm from uh, Western Colorado. Okay. And, uh, my family, my wife's family, is from Southeast Ohio, and we ended up here, um, raised our two kids here, and fell in yeah. love with it. How did this come about? This exhibit at Toledo Museum of Art. I had an exhibition at uh, Ellie Louver Gallery in Venice, California, in 2018. And the curators came to that exhibition, and that really was the foundation for kind of the building blocks of this exhibition in Toledo. So a lot of those works, that was at a period of time when my ideas of mark making, my ideas of gesture making were becoming abstracted as I was exploring just what it means to um, make a mark as, a, as, a, as an individual. Yeah. And so that period of time was super um, uh, intense. It was super um, exploratory and became the foundation for the different ideas behind this exhibition in Toledo. Well, you speak of those ideas, and you've got some really interesting ideas about art in general and, and how people interpret it. I mean, when they go to the museum, they're going to see these great big uh, pieces, these, I guess you would call them sculptures. How how would you characterize those? There's sculptures in the traditional sense you know of their objects in space the medium that i use um is kind of a sculptural medium of clay which is something that you can squish you know and have this kind of print making uh material uh that uh then is memory uh throughout time right of gesture of curiosity but then that transforms into painting a lot of the boundaries between painting and recording uh print making uh, sculpture, uh, that all kind of collapses in many ways around just being curious and being exploratory of the world. So these objects, they are um, exploring nature, basically self in, uh, in nature, you know, body in nature. So there's figures, there's plants, there's the exploration of my own psychology as I mm. explore art history and mark making and argue with um, things that interrupt me from moving forward, right? I ask questions of material that then teach me about the world and give me a foundation to continue forward and keep challenging my concept of craft and um, uh, value and devotion and curiosity, um, caretaking concepts that are rooted in acts of gardening and just nature itself um, and mm. humanity. So like those become, that becomes the rich material. And so the objects are really the debris of this other work going on. I've been thinking. So that's what the title of the exhibition, which is phenomenal debris, which was kind of, which the curator Diane Wright took out of some of the words that I was saying about my practice, which the point, you know, is the exploration of self, the exploration of, of the world, um, the kind of the the healing taking place like that's the point mm -hmm. right and then and then the kind of the objects become the debris of that the kind of the memory of that pursuit 
taking place, you know, and which is memory exploring the concept of nature, the exploring um, the fragility of nature, the fragility of the mind, and that being just memory of culture inevitably as they travel through, you know, time. One of the things that strike me is uh, that your art is very personal. It tells a story about you. It, it you know, is sampled from different parts, different times in your career and artistic development. Um, how much of you is in each of these works? How much of it speaks to you biographically? I think they all do because it's like it's like psychological recording in a way. It's it's kind of anthropology. You know, it's exploring why do we see images in things? Like why have we evolved to see images in trees or in the stars or or in the ground, in the in the field and silhouettes? You know, and so that just becomes this like subject matter of exploring and recording how the mind moves forward. And so there's kind of an anthropo anthropological and uh, nature to that kind of recording. And so inevitably, it's, it's, it's a self-portrait of my own psychology, um, but it's also just getting at other universals that about being creative in the world and being curious in the world and being pushing oneself forward, evolving as oneself in the world. So then it just becomes like more an embodiment of that attempt at culture to move forward, mm -hmm. you know? I, lo I love the idea of working with materials that, that are very earthy and very connected right, to Right, because it's the nature. ground, you know, beneath yeah. you. It's like, what is this material that I'm standing on and squishing it, you know? It, and, it, and that squish is a question, but that squish is also a printmaking, you know? It's a memory of mm. that question being asked, yeah. you know? And so it's like, what is this space that we inhabit? You know, how? what are... Um, what is my past? What is our past? You know, collectively, and doing these gestures, these simple gestures of asking questions, tr go back to origin of us. You know, yeah. of like so that gesture, you connect to the past in ways that maybe um, emotionally. You know, uh, by asking that question, you connect. Yeah, to things mm -hmm. that were m much bigger than us. You know, yeah, and, and or me. Personally, in pre my present self, right? Well, it's a touchstone of sorts because everybody will bring their own, you know, for lack of a better word, their own baggage to right. what they see, you right. know, with your art. But, but it's it, not baggage. I don't think it's baggage. It's yeah. like it's the work that they're doing in their work, in their world, right? Right. And, and, their, and so my hope is that that memory becomes just a part of then their reaction, their work, their building blocks as they navigate space and think about material differently, think about creative gesture differently. Mm. So hopefully, like, um, they're just more building blocks. Well, I think creatively, sound, music, taste, you know, um, um, ceremony, those are all these, like, cultural building blocks that we, and reminders, you know, of, of this larger thing that we're doing as a culture. Well, I wanted to bring Mary Claire in because Mary Claire is also a creator. She's mm -hmm. a composer and has written a, a number of works. And it's interesting to see this kind of, you know, cross uh, genre going on here between That's music mm -hmm. and right. and art. I wonder what comes to mind for you, Mary Claire, when when well, Matt I, is talking. I was wondering about your creative process. Maybe if you want to kind of walk us through, you know, when you have the you know initial idea for a project and how you get started and how you kind of bring it um, to fruition, I'm just kind of curious to hear right. how that goes for you. I think it's like vulnerability in space. So like, <clears throat> I think my work is about, has always been about creating the context where I can be fully alive as an individual and, and fully vulnerable and recording these feelings and states that, are just truth that have truth in them, and so mm -hmm. like there, one one can't come with uh, with ideas into that space. I mean, the, or with with uh, <clears throat> they're not premeditated. The works, you know, it's it's a discovery, mm -hmm. and so coming into a space free of that, where am I now? Asking that question, like who am I now? Uh, what does this space feel like? Like mm -hmm. how can I move forward? And then ine inevitably, quickly, something emerges, you know, language emerges, visual language, emotive, mm -hmm. emotive language. And I think those are all the languages that I've grew up kind of um, as tools because I've always struggled with, um, with written language, I think, uh, or, or kind of words, the words, the language of words, sure, you know. Sure. 
Um, and I've always had a different kind of emotive language that I've connected to ever since I was a child. And so that then becomes a medium. And so I think my work is about um, being present, setting up conditions for gestures to take place, making a plinth, leaving the studio, mm -hmm. coming back and, okay, what exists here today? <clears throat> making a gesture, leaving, coming back. What is this? You know, who am what is you know what is this work that is taking place and then it then the gestures just unfold and respond to each other with clay they shrink they dry the the water disappears mm -hmm. you know so that the living nature of them in the act of sculpting disappears and they become mm -hmm. a kind of the shell in a different object right and then you fire it it's even different so then you have this object out of the kiln that you have to then reapproach as like, okay, how do I contend with this new thing? Mm -hmm. um, and I've been recently, I've been glazing and realizing that like my my emotions are what dictates color. Like if I'm if I'm listening to music or if I'm listening to just the birds or contending with grief or longing or curiosity or or urgency or working through states that might that dictates where the colors how the colors respond to the form i see purples or the color of bruising you know taking mm -hmm. place or shifting kind of un pushing in a form there for some reason that's giving me that knowledge there like and i it's more about recording that color as an emotive state of kind of mm -hmm. language yeah it's so interesting to hear about the mindfulness that you have when you approach this and how that creates space for the artwork to grow and become just in the moment. Right. Um, and then it's about trust. Yeah, interesting. Right? What is the moment that you feel like, or is there a moment when you realize, okay, this is ready to to be fired and in the kiln? Because mm. uh, I feel like whenever I compose songs, it's always like I'm always fiddling with this or no. that, and I never quite know when to call it finished. Right. Um, do you ever get you know the sense of, all right, this is, this is done, I've... Sometimes you <laughs> finish. Uh, sometimes you finish a piece, and sometimes it finishes you. Yeah, right? yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think with with clay in glazing, there's a couple of different types of works in the studio. One one idea is putting glaze on a form and firing it. And with glaze, you're painting in grays and and these other hues. It, you might be putting on yellow, but it's gray, you mm -hmm. know. Or you might be putting on blue, but it's like a sh uh, a shade of green, Interesting. you know, or black and it's green. So you're painting like I am painting yellow but you're painting visually like mm -hmm. white or gray so you're you're uh, as you're doing this you're i'm yellow here purple here gray here these colors shift together they need to be kind of like dissolving here <clears throat> and that's all this fictional image that you're constructing in your mind it's not mm -hmm. taking place in front of you and so you're building this world of an object that you imagine that you long for that you think is taking place and then you put it into the kiln and you and Inevitably, when you when it comes out, it's a number of degrees just different, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I have to let go of that that image that I've constructed. I because the kiln is so it can tear things apart. You know, things mm -hmm. can just be destroyed in that space. It's such an intense kind of um, furnace of heat and sh shrinkage and just. Yeah. Um, yeah, intensity that it has to withstand. So then it comes out, and you're just, and then it's more about embracing um, what you know, what you don't know. And a lot of these works are just fired once as kind of a record keeping of mm -hmm. that. It's important for me not to cover up mistake, you know, or to kind of deny my vulnerability or my kind of the the fallibility mm -hmm. as like allow fallibility to be human. And to be present in kind of this memory of this argument moving forward, you know, mm -hmm. and so they're just fired once as like uh, as as um, record keeping, I guess. It seems very meta to me in in <laughs> some ways, and almost with a primitive aspect to it. Like looking mm -hmm. at pictures of your work, Matt, I see a little bit of you know almost cubist elements coming in there, and and I'm talking about like your drawings and things mm -hmm. like that. It seems to be very connected, all of your art, not just the stuff you make out of earthen-type materials, but it seems like you're always thinking about outside the box, as it were. You're always thinking about what 
is behind and what is in front of of everything that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think about that with gardening and cooking and baking, everything, know, and yeah. cleaning my studio and and having my work in my periphery, not looking at it. Just not looking at it, but living with it, mm. tending to my space as an act of caretaking, which allows me to understand my work objectively. So I, there's all these different states of like navigating the practice of kind of creative being, being present or like with my children who I homeschool, which is, um, a full time job, you know, since mm-hmm. the, um, over the past three years. And then that becomes this space. I think. That's been the biggest influence on my practice to kind of reframe how I understand art and creative, creative gesture and, and what the meaning is, the true value of creative practice. Mm. You know, when I allow space for them and I see them just like in delight and curiosity and just like wowed by the things they discover, mm-hmm. like then it's, that's just, that's the point. Like it's not really about the object, you know, it's this exploration and curiosity of the world, you know, as we navigate and move forward. And it's like, wow. That, the, yeah. They are reminders of that for me in my practice, um, because there's all, so many, so much baggage with craft history or clay as not sculpture or hierarchies within painting and sculpture that are just <clears throat> in the way, in many ways of uh, in getting uh, getting away from the kind of origin of like what it, what creativity actually can do in society mm-hmm. and the, the the impact that it can have on people and the the healing that needs to take place in communities and ourselves. Yeah. We're talking with artist Matt Wadle, whose uh, exhibition, Phenomenal Debris, is at the Toledo Museum of Art in November. And, Matt, I'm looking at the book that they're handing out. I guess they're doing this slightly differently in the way that your artwork is displayed. They're not putting, like, you don't walk in and see it all up on the wall with the name of what it is and what it's about. But people have this little booklet, and they can listen to you, right, through uh, introductions. There's an audio recording. They've actually taken text from some writing that I've been doing over the three years that's on the wall. And then they actually had me do some writing in the space. Uh, over During the pandemic, I've been trying to think about – my my walls as like a kind of ability to record too so if when i'm when i'm in like a state of my work i might come across a philosophy or a marker uh, language that encapsulates some kind of bridge that i'm trying to kind of step over or work through and so i've been kind of scribbling those on the wall because i'm i lose things i lose papers i lose my keys i i hmm. uh, and so but but when i write it on the wall it's it's there you know it stays put so that when I'm in it, when I'm in that state again, I and I'm looking for those that memory of like where I had gotten to mm. philosophically. I can kind of pull from them, and so during the exhibition, they they took some of those off the wall, or they highlighted some of these kind of points that I was working through, and we had we kind of brought them into the gallery space. Yeah, well, I mean, in a way, that's the essence of creativity, you know, that you're encouraging everybody to have that artistic experience right keep a notebook you know keep yeah. keep something to write down and, and uh, the idea that our phones are just these amazing communication devices you know i think that's why you maybe bring up the idea of meta it's like now too it's, it's a communication device it's memory um and i use my phone constantly to kind of record mm-hmm. thoughts and it's just the most efficient communication device we've yeah. constructed you know <laughs> and so to try to figure out how to use that as a, as a studio practice and record thoughts and um, some people just need a pen- pencil and paper, though. <laughs> yeah. Now, many of the the works in this exhibit are just very large in terms of actual physical size. Um, how do you use scale to communicate these different ideas that you're you're trying to express? Right. I think a lot of my work encompasses kind of body space, it's, which is kind of psychological body space. Which is So my kiln is the space in which I can stretch my arms out and stretch mm-hmm. them to the side and, and move freely as an individual. And so it's kind of, there's a performative nature to sculpting, um, just like music, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's generally in, in solace, right? Um, so like having room for breath to take place. And so that generally is the space of, it's like a seven foot by seven foot cube, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's my kiln. But then outside of that, I make larger work. Then there's these moments of just fragility and and um, smaller works that just hold sometimes so much greater resonance than the larger mm. works, right? 
mm-hmm. and because it's they can be gentler on your mind, on your back, on your on your hands, um, like cradle. You can cradle them, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it's a different. The, I I work in different scales, just depending on um, space and states and uh, where I'm at. Um, my daughter's got me make. I make dolls for her, you know, to paint. Uh-huh. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Out of ceramics or how, yeah, yeah, we we get a bunch of colored porcelain and we just kind of squish it and uh, play with it. And nice, um, she's usually getting me to step outside of myself to discover more exciting things like fireflies and um, bugs, you know, and in, right. in the garden and yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of your, uh, especially your sculptures are abstract, right? And I'm looking through this book. There are 132 different um, pieces exhibited here, ranging from, you know, portraits, pastel on paper, to right. the huge sculptures that, that Mary Claire was talking about. Right. And one thing that unites all of these works, aside from, you know, what we've been talking about, your philosophy of art, is the sense of color, and the sense of decay as well that kind of plays into how you use color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of like as you argue with things or as I was making petals for a long time and there would be like a, a systematic nature to it. It would, it would, and that seemed to be a, um, uh, that started to be kind of an imprisonment, you know, where the repetition of, became an imprisonment, you know, and my hands started to hurt. My hands needed to be softer. My hands needed to touch the clay differently. My mm-hmm. mind was needing to deal with different topics. You know, so as I started to kind of touch clay differently and softer, it became more about just gesture and less about kind of this um, systematic kind of petal structure, plant form, representational plant form, right? It became about gesture. And those gestures become, that. I guess that's the language of abstraction because it's exploring mark making yeah. in space and, and just the exploration of material. So it's not really abstraction. It's it's just material being squished, you know, and the deliciousness <laughs> of that, and yeah. and material being rolled out, and eighty pounds of coil trying to be picked up by myself in the studio and, and applied to this object. <clears throat> so it's about the accumulation of material. I've been thinking about abstraction as this vehicle for images to emerge from, as like um, as one would uh, maybe s- <clears throat> drifting off to sleep see. Uh, be in the kind of semi dream state, or hear mm-hmm. hear children's laughter. You know, whenever you're drifting off to sleep, or um, looking into the trees. You know, like yeah. that's the that's where, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of this origin of like where mythology, mm-hmm. like origin mythology, came from. Yeah. You know, of like um, contending with fears and um, fragility, and having these kind of images populate your space as like. Yeah, that's the basis of mythology. So, yeah, like, it's part of the shared human experience, in right? A way, you right. Know? And so, I don't know if it's they're not really abstract either. They're they're recordings, and so some of them might they're they're representational recordings of images seen, you know. And so, in in many ways, it's kind of it's a form. All abstraction is a form of like represent representation, right? Of space presence, or rendering a form an emotive form, right? Yeah. I was just looking actually um, at some different works that you have of stoneware and porcelain, and I saw that one of your pieces uses whipped porcelain. Right. What is whipped porcelain? Well, um, with glaze, you put it on the form, and then the mark making can be the color melting in the heat, Mm -hmm. right? So that the the mark making of the glaze dripping is isn't a brush stroke; it's just the glaze dripping, right? And there was a there was a point where I was frustrated when I was making mark makings in the studio and having this whole world of exploration that the viewer never could engage with. So I knew a, like there was this disconnect between my practice mm-hmm. and I wanted the color exploration to be the same as the viewer saw. And so I started to kind of, to add pigments to the porcelain, basically throwing chunks of porcelain in a bucket and whipping it and blending it with color and then scooping it out. It's like the consistency of um, cream cheese. Oh, interesting. Colored and it's as delicious. I, not not taste wise, right? But just the feeling. It has yeah, the same yeah. palate and deliciousness of just deliciousness of material. And so then it becomes just like the exploration of this kind of colored cream cheese, whipped cream cheese that you're exploring 
and obliterating form and arguing with form, arguing, arguing with gesture. You've brought taste and texture into the mix because you're engaging yet another one of our senses, which is the idea of, you know, you're making my mouth water talking about right. <laughs> cream in, cheese. Right, in some of the glazes, you know, in, in the studio, you make these glazes and they're just delicious, you know, and then you paint with this delicious material. The clay has a smell to it, right? Yeah. Of earth or um, iron, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, we can we can talk all about your philosophy and your art all day long, but probably the best thing for folks to do if they're interested in this is to visit your exhibit at uh, the Toledo Museum of Art. It's called Phenomenal Debris by our guest, Matt Wedel, who is uh, in town, not only exhibiting your work, but also guiding people through the process of absorbing and seeing and interacting with your art. Of the pieces in this exhibit, is there one that really stands out to you as something that's especially personal or meaningful in some way? And I know that's probably hard with right. with um, all these pieces that are so, of course, important to you, but is there one that really stands out to you? I think there's two. I think the idea that I could show my paintings that the museum uh, saw, I never thought that I would show them. You know, I, I, they, mm-hmm. they, they were all in a grouping in my studio for, for a, quite a while. And the idea that they... they put that out there. I'm so grateful of to be able to see them together. Um, but mostly there's a series of two benches that are in the show that I made during the pandemic. And it was, they're called mourning benches, like M-O-U, the act of mm-hmm. mourning, right? Um, and it's just a space of, for me, they were as objects, a space where I was kind of working through my own work as an individual, as gesture. Um, so like I, I'd seen this form, it then emerged into a bench, and then sitting at the at the end, like the 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 gesture making was me asking the work, how to move forward in space, right? Mm-hmm. How to relink, how to how to shed, the burdens that are keeping me from being human, right? And that as mark making, that is like the origin of why the intentionality behind that mark making is this kind of work taking place, serious work, you know. It's cultural work, this self, our evolution, our attempt at trying to be present and be um, active and work through so that we can uh, um, approach the many kind of challenging things that, you know, we face in the world. Mm -hmm. The exhibit is called Phenomenal Debris, all the works by Matt Wadel, who has uh, agreed to come talk with us today. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Super grateful.